Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Esme, for the introduction. So, yeah, as um, Esme said, I am a public health nutritionist working with the Brighton Hope Food Partnership on a range of projects with people who are um, on low incomes or living with food insecurity on how to eat well. But also, interestingly, with the other parts of this session today, I am also a health and nutrition coach working on a few European projects as well. So um, I can kind of put my ideas forwards on that side as well. So in this session, we're going to briefly look at the impact of food insecurity on diet and health. We're going to go back to basics. There's a lot of confusion around what a balanced diet actually is. So we're going to look at what the evidence based facts are. And then we're going to briefly look at food marketing in relation to added sugar and giving you some tools to understand what is healthy versus what sounds healthy. Um, and then in the question and answer bit, um, I think we'd like to focus a little bit on what um, the challenges people face on eating well when living with food insecurity or on a budget um, and think of some positive changes that people can make. So one of Flavour's key objectives is to prevent food waste across the area and redistribute this to support people living with food insecurity. And this is relevant now more than ever um, as more people are facing insecure, uh, food insecurity. So let's look at why it is important to ensure people have adequate diet and the impact of poverty on diet. So unsurprisingly, poverty Poverty has a massive negative effect on diet and health. We know from UK data from the National Diet and Nutrition Survey that people on the lowest incomes generally consume less lean meat, fish, fruit and veg, um, as these are more expensive than lower nutrient foods. And these are the foods that contain good quality protein, iron, vitamin and minerals. We also know people on low incomes eat more processed foods and these are higher in fat and salt and this impacts heart health and they consume more added sugar as well. And we know children from lower income backgrounds have higher incidences of dental caries. And there are a huge other range of negative effects that poor diet and food poverty have on health, including mental health, muscular health and immune health. So if we are able to enable people to access better food and give them the tools and the knowledge to um, put this into their diet and improve their diets, then it's got to be a good thing. So when we look at a balanced diet, what do we actually mean? As I said at the beginning, there is a lot of confusing and contradictory information out there in internet land, isn't there? So let's revisit the facts. So. I'm just showing you two, the two kind of evidence-based guides that the UK and Belgium produced. So in the UK, we've got the Eat Well Guide, which is developed by Public Health England. And in Belgium, you have your food uh, pyramid, which is developed by the Flemish government. And whilst they are, there are some differences in these, so in, um, in Belgium, you have a focus. Oh, I need to on, be you have a focus on eating less ultra processed foods, and there's quite a social aspect around eating. Um, and in the UK, it looks at food labelling. There is a lot of similarities, um, and this is based on the best scientific information we have available. So, what exactly is that? So, a balanced diet includes eating fruit and vegetables every day. Fruit and veg provide fiber, vitamins and minerals, which is needed for good health. So in the UK, we have the five plus a day, a message of, and a portion is the size of your fist. Um, and it's good to know for people on lower incomes that tinned and frozen count towards your fruit and veg, and also that seasonal, um, and tins and frozen are generally cheaper options. Both countries talk um, about including a portion of oily fish a week. 
and um, this gives us the required amounts of omega-3 fatty acids that we need for brain and heart health. Um, and whilst fresh oily fish like salmon and mackerel count, it's also good to know that cheaper tinned oily fish like pilchards, sardines, um, mackerel and anchovies also count. But just as a little, um, uh, people often don't realise, but tinned tuna and fresh tuna don't actually count towards your oily fish intake. So what should we be including more of? So we be, should be switching from animal proteins and replacing or introducing more plant-based sources of protein. So this includes things like beans and pulses and tofu. Generally, these proteins are cheap and nutritious um, and we can look at including them adding them to meat dishes to dilute the amount of meat or having swapping them for um, meat in, um, instead of meat, sorry. We should be uh, eating less saturated fats. So saturated fats are things like butter and meat, fat on meat, and these are generally solid at room temperature um, and mainly derived from animal products. And these have negative impacts on heart health. So we, do, we should be looking to switching to more unsaturated fats. So these are things like vegetable oil, nuts and seeds and oily fish. Um, and we should be looking at having unsweetened dairy, um, dairy in smaller amounts or dairy alternatives like um, plant milks, but choosing the unsweetened versions of these. So what should we be eating less of? Well, food and drinks containing lots of free sugars. Um, and I'll talk about what a free sugar actually is. We should be eating less processed meat. So this is things like ham, bacon, frankfurters, cured meats. These are, this is because these foods are higher in salt and nitrates. And this is linked to an increased risk of bowel and stomach cancers. And we should be eating less fried food. Fried food generally is higher in fat, tends to be more processed and is higher in overall calories and less nutrient dense. So what does this look like in terms of making changes? So rather than thinking of changing everything, it could be small things. So it could be things like swapping to a whole grain cereal or wholemeal bread. It could be having a meat free day once a week. It could even be swapping to diet versions of fizzy drinks or it could be having hummus instead of ham in your sandwich. Changes don't need to be massive to start with. They can be small changes across time. And it is really um, important to realise that healthy diets look really different. You can be a healthy um, vegan. You can be a healthy um, vegetarian you can be a healthy meat eater um, no there's no one way of eating and no one's diet is perfect so let's look briefly at food marketing so i've talked about in the previous one eating less added sugar and in the uk and in belgium both populations eat significantly more than the recommended amount of added sugar um, but what do we actually mean when we talk about added sugar? So free or added sugars are sugars that are added into food and drinks or those found naturally in both juices, honey and syrups. What doesn't count towards your added sugar intake is um, sugars that are found naturally within the cells of um, plants like fruits and vegetables. Um, and milk sugar, so lactose, and that's found in milk and dairy products. But food marketers have recognised that people are definitely more aware of sugar these days and um, a bit more sugar savvy. So they have a few tactics to make us not be aware that there's maybe so much sugar in a product. Um, sometimes it's calling it by another name. To, or making it sound healthier. So for example, agave syrup is marketed as lower GI. Um, so it makes your, meant to make your blood sugars not uh, spike as much. 
coconut sugar may be marketed as having more nutrients, more minerals in it, um, and date syrups are natural sugar derived from dates. Um, so they're marketed as healthier alternatives, but in reality, they exert exactly the same effect on our body as bog standard table sugar. Um, and they are still classified as a free sugar. And if you just look at this infographic from the British Heart Foundation, you can see that sugar is given a whole range of names. Um, so when you're looking at a product, um, be aware that it might be called something else. And when we look at marketing, um, uh, manufacturers like to put health buzzwords on products to make them seem healthier than they actually are. So it does, you know, things like gluten free, farm fresh, all natural are all things that a manufacturers put on products to make us buy them because we think they're healthier. But some good questions to consider with this is to ask what type of product is it? So if it is a gluten free cake, it's still a cake. It's going to have lots of fat and sugar in it. Um, think about what the product is in the first place. And would that product naturally have some the free ingredient in it? So I've seen gluten free water and gluten free yogurt. Both of those things are never going to have gluten in in the first place anyway. If something's labelled as fat, um, reduced fat or low fat, what is replacing that ingredient? So low fat products can be higher in sugar. And read the ingredient list is a really good place to start. Ingredients are listed in order. That means the first ingredient makes up the most of that food. So look out for ingredients that have sugar, salt or fat high up the list of ingredients. So that's the recommendations in a very brief whistle stop tour. <laughs> um, but the reality of making, you know, taking those recommendations and putting them into place can be, you know, difficult. And there are many challenges that people face. So um, in this next part, in the question and answers bit, um, we could perhaps discuss some of that. Thank you. So, Esme, are we going to do question and answers in this section or do you want me to just continue with what I was, continue? Um, yeah, it's a good talk, Fran. How about you continue through your presentation and then we'll take all questions and answers at the end because then we can stop sharing a screen and we can see everyone. Sure. Easier. Lovely. Thanks, Fran. No worries. Okay. So, what, as I said, there's the recommendations and then there's the reality of the situation. So what actually gets in the way of eating well? Well, there are lots of things that can get in the way of eating well. If uh, you don't have enough money to buy good food, then that's going to stop you from eating well. If you don't have the skills and the ability to cook with ingredients, um, with uh, base ingredients and you've not been brought up in a household that has given you that understanding and background then that's going to be a challenge um, if you live in uh, if your housing is um, poor you don't have an oven you've just got a microwave you're living in damp housing um, you've got no money for electricity to cook you can't have an oven on for a long period of time that gets in the way of eating well. Um, if you are suffering from illness or you're on certain medications, that can impact your ability. And also your motivation to change. If you are in a situation where food and eating well is the last thing on your mind, then your motivation to change is going to be really low. So what can help? I mean, I've worked with, um, and no, I, I've worked with homelessness, um, people in vulnerable housing, families on low incomes, um, people with um, uh, living in supported housing with mental health. 
Um, and there are some things that can help. I think one of the key things is, no, is, is being well connected to um, the community and your, where you're working and knowing what help and resources available. Um, so community kitchens, growing projects, um, your children and family centres, any um, support that you have around your community and getting people um, engaged with this is, is a really nice thing. Um, giving people eating well on a budget information so that they know how to eat well on a budget and how to cook with limited equipment and money. Um, and then I think also, and I think Esme will be talking about this um, in the next bit, is the recommendations versus the reality and, and working with got what you've got. If you are trying to get someone to, you're telling them, well, you've got to eat five five portions of fruit and veg a day because that's the recommendations but actually they're having zero at the moment then you know that's not motivating and they're not that's too big a change to make um you know it might be that you're looking at having uh one or a few portions a week even it's about working with what you've got at the time and another thing I think is reducing um, stigma and making people aware of benefits available to them because, um, you know, it isn't food that gets people out of food poverty. It is money and um, help and resources. Um, and so, for example, in the UK, um, there are things like healthy start vouchers uh, that, that young families can have to access fruit and veg and milk and vitamins. But only 50% of uh, people who are eligible actually access that. So being aware of what available benefits are, I think is really useful. So I'm obviously open to talk about anything that I've chatted about. Um, I'm aware that this is quite headline information, but um, I welcome to your questions and thank you all for listening. <laughs>